Hey folks, welcome back to the Brehan Academy. I'm Kevin Flanagan. In this video, I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into the Fomorians, one of the mythical races of beings from the Irish sagas. Uh, you heard about these beings, the Fomorians, in the book The Lauragavala Aaron. And they're quite interesting, as we're about to find out. I would say even more interesting in some ways than the two I had it done in themselves. Before I jump into that, of course, please, I invite you to check out the website, brehenacademy.org. If you become a member, you can access the library there, right? And most of the, if not all of the resources that I'm using in this video are all available in the library for a free download if you uh, become a member. I also have a free course that I've just launched, a Crash Course on Gaelic Ireland. So if you sign up, you can also get access to that too. Now, with that being said, let's just jump straight into the video. video we're going to explore a group that's even older and more elusive and mysterious than the Tuatha de Danann and that is the Fomorians. When we read in the early Irish mythology in the Lower Gavala, the book of the takings of Ireland, we hear about these different migrations of people who travel to Ireland to settle here. The first we hear about are the Caesarians, then we hear about the the Medians, the Parthalonians, and so on. And all the while, there's another group in the background, lingering, ever-present, watching. And that is the Fomorians. The Fomorians are a difficult group to research, and it takes you down some very strange and unusual paths with a lot of conjecture. You tend to end up in places like Atlantis and so on. My aim with this video is to shine some light on what's really a shadowy and mysterious race of beings. And my typical format, I like to kind of do a kaleidoscope of different images, different quotes that I've researched, different ideas and piece them together in a kind of a tapestry to try and help give you a clearer understanding and deeper appreciation of this mythology. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the Fomorians and that's going to involve us also meeting a few other groups along the way. We're going to meet the Fearbulgs, we're going to meet the Tuatha de Danann, and we're going to meet some interesting characters. Two characters in particular who kind of bring a big question mark over the relationship between these types of people, these groups of peoples. And that is Brez, who was half Fomorian and half Tuatha de Danann. And while he had Fomorian relatives, he ended up ruling the Tuatha de Danann while Noada was wounded. And then you have Lu, a sort of semi-divine or fully divine god-king a leader of the Tuatha de Danann in battle against the Fomorians, who was prophesied to defeat his grandfather, Balor of the Mighty Blows, or Balor of the Evil Eye, who was the leader of the Fomorians. And like Braz, Lu was also half Tuatha de Danann and half Fomorian. This video is going to be a great complement to my other videos, Who Were the Fear Bulks? and the arrival of the Tuatha de Danann. In those videos, we learned about the prehistory of Ireland up to the first battle of Moitora. The Tuatha de Danann had defeated the Fuilbulgs, but still there was another, earlier, group of inhabitants on the island who they would have to contend with, and this is the Fomorians. So who were the Fomorians? Were they giants? Were they, were they gods? Were they monsters? Uh, were they pirates? Edmund Curtis in his History of Ireland from the earliest times to 1922 said the Fomorians were gloomy giants of the sea. In the north of Ireland, on the shore of County Antrim, we find the famous Giant's Causeway. It's a channel of approximately 40,000 hexagonal 
hexagonal <laughs> basalt columns that was once said to be an ancient pathway for giants to cross between the northern coast of Ireland and the western coast of Scotland. In Irish, this place is called Chlochan na Fawarach, which means literally the stepping stones of the Fomorians. The Fomori, as they're also called, are closely associated with the sea and its islands. And the name, some people suggest, could mean under the sea. And they're often described as coming from under the sea. In Irish, Fui Mara would be under the sea. So you have Fui Mara as a kind of a closely related form linguistically to Formorian or Formora. So some people speculate that it could have something to do with that. In a late account of the mythological story, the second battle of Moitora, it names 33 leaders of the Fomorian, uh, 32 of them plus their high king. In her book, Celtic Ireland, Sophie Bryant describes the Fomorians as sea rovers. And she speculates that they might be a tribe of Ugrian, I think it's pronounced Ugrian extraction, coming around the north of Scotland from Denmark or Scandinavia. And she says if this Ugrian race settled, however sparsely in Scotland, and the two had the came to Ireland from that country, it is easy to imagine one way in which the modification of Gael by Ugrian might have come to pass in them. So you can see that even though they're shrouded in this mystery that they might be from the sea or somehow monstrous, that there has been speculation, historical and anthropological research into migrations of people on these islands uh, that lead people to think that there might be some truth in this. In the Patriot History of Ireland, Cusack says that the Fomorians are a race of pirates of whom little is known. And according to the annals of Clonmacnoise, they were a sept descended from Cham, or Cham, the son of Noah, and lived by piracy and spoil of other nations, and were in those days very troublesome to the whole world. End quote. Patrick Weston Joyce, one of my favourite writers on early Irish history, speaking on the Fomorian, says, quote, the Fomorians were a race of sea robbers who, according to some, came originally from Africa. Their two chiefs, Mork and Conning, lived in a wonderful fortress called Tor Conning on Tory Island off the coast of Donegal. And after the death of Named, they tyrannised over his people and made them pay an intolerable yearly tribute of corn, butter, cattle and children. So the Nemedians, unable to bear their miserable state any longer, rose up in a fury. In Anno Monday 3066, they destroyed Tor Cunning and slew Cunning himself and all his family. But Moore attacked them soon after and a dreadful battle was fought on the sea beach in which nearly all the combatants fell. And those who were not killed in battle were drowned for the combatants fought so furiously that they gave no heed to the advancing tidal wave which rose and overwhelmed them. Of the Nemedians, only the crew of one bark escaped, and Moore and his Fomorians remained masters of Tory. Seven years after the battle, a part of the Nemedians fled from Ireland under three chiefs, Simon Breck, Iba, and Britan Mail. Simon Breck and his people went to the north of Greece, and from them were the descendants, the Fearbulgs, Iba, and his followers, who were the ancestors of the Dedanans, made their way to that part of Greece in which the city of Athens is situated, and those who went with Britain Mail settled in the north of Alban or Scotland. The few Nemedians that remained behind dwelt in Ireland for more than 200 years under the bitter tyranny of the Fomorians. End quote. From P.W. Joyce's A Short History of Ireland from the Earliest Times to 1608. As an aside here, I also want to mention the Moor connection. We talk of the Fimurians and there are writings that talk about the, the darkness of their skin. And while I haven't been able to verify this in an academic sense, I have come across pieces of information and 
It seems to be something that's present in the folk memory of a connection between the Irish and North Africa. For example, there is a short Irish film. And if I remember it correctly, there's like a pilot who crashes in the desert and he's not able to communicate. There's a, there's a, 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 a nomadic man finds him. And he has trouble communicating when he tries to communicate in English. But when they switch to Irish, all of a sudden, they're able to communicate. Now, this is just a funny little movie. Um, but I do have friends from, from Libya and Algeria. And um, I do. One of my friends from Libya is from the Barbar culture. Um, and he plays the traditional Barbar music. I, I say it's this Irish music that you're playing because the music is very similar. So we're talking about a period of time that's so far back in the mists of time that is very difficult to speak with any certainty. But it doesn't seem to be a huge stretch to think that perhaps the Fomorians were from North Africa. I read it somewhere, and I think I think even Jeffrey Keating mentions this, the Fomoraic could mean from the West or something like that. So that's somebody who traveled from the West, uh, from the East, excuse me, from the East. Uh, so there's like some speculation about a connection between the Fomorians, um, the North Africa, the Barbers, and early Irish uh, culture. That being said, let's just take a couple of minutes to recap the timeline that we're talking about here. So we don't use BC and AD, we use the phrase AM, which means Anno Mundi. It's the chronology of the world. And in the past, they believed that they could calculate when the world actually began, um, that it was created by God and how old it actually was. So when we say Anno Mundi, we're talking about the age of the world from when it was created by God himself. <laughs> so that's what Anno Mundi means. I'm going to pull this information from Eleanor Hull's Epochs of History, Volume 2, on the section on early Christian Ireland. Okay, She has a page here, a section here called Age of the World. So the, the dates given here are those that are also appearing in the Annals of the Four Master. So just to put that into context for you, if I calculated this right, the year Anno Mundi, 5,782, began at sunset on the 18th of September, 2021. So if the calculations are correct, <laughs> um, that's how old the world is. So that should give us just a little bit of context for understanding the following dates that I'm going to use. You can use that as a reference point that the current year Anno Mundi would be 5,782 if I'm correct, calculating that correct based on the information that I have. Now the annals of Ireland begin in Anno Mundi 2,242 and with the coming of Caesar to Ireland or Caesar, depending on your pronunciation, in the year Anno Mundi 2242. And so this was the year of the Great Flood. This is the date that's given by the Four Masters as that of the coming of Caesar to Ireland. And this was apparently 40 days before the Great Flood began. Anno Mundi 2520 is given as the date when Partholon came to Ireland. And for 200 years before the coming of Partholon, it's written that the Fomorian had subsisted by fowling and fishing. Alwyn Rees and Brinley Rees in Celtic Heritage, an ancient tradition in Ireland and Wales, said that, quote, the Fomori had already made their presence known in the time of Partholon. The Lower Gavala Aaron describes them in that context as beings with single arms and single legs. They were led by Kikul Grickenkos, son of Gaul, the one-eyed, son of Garab, the wolf. Each of their four ships, companies, comprised 50 men and thrice 50 women, and their predominantly female character is further emphasised by the description of Kikul's monstrous mother, Lot. Her bloated lips were in her breast, she had four eyes on her back, and she equalled all her troop in strength. According to some versions, the Fomori were destroyed in their battle with Partholon, 
According to others, though the battle was fought for a week, not a man was slain there for it was a magic battle. That's the end of the quote. In Anno Mundi 2530, the Fomorians, in one account, were defeated by Partholon at Magyth, County Donegal. And these events are recorded in the Annals of Ireland. In Anno Mundi 2820, Partholon's people die of the plague. In 2850, Nemed came to Ireland. In 3066, the Fomorian Tower of Conan on Tory Island is destroyed by the race of Nemed, but Nemedians are defeated and only 30 of their race survive and escape Ireland. Again, Reese says ultimately Nemed's people assaulted the Tower of Conan, but after they had secured his downfall, more appeared with three score ships and only one ship with 30 warriors of Nemed's people escaped from the slaughter that ensued. End quote. In John O'Donovan's translation of the Annals of the Kingdom of Ireland, Volume 1, at the year on a Monday 3066, he writes the demolition of the Tower of Conan in this year by the race of Nemed against Conan, son of Favour, and the Fomorians in general, in revenge for all the oppression they had inflicted upon them, the race of Nemed, as is evident from the chronicle which is called Laragavala, and they nearly f all fell by each other. Thirty persons alone of the race of the Nemed escaped to different quarters of the world, and they came to Ireland some time afterwards as fear bullocks. Two hundred and sixteen years Nemed and his race remained in Ireland. After this, Ireland was a wilderness for a period of two hundred years. End quote. And on Monday, three thousand two hundred and sixty-six, the arrival of the fear bulk. So just to recap, there was a group of people who came to Ireland called the Nemedians. They had been oppressed and tyrannised by the Fomorians. They rose up against the Fomorians and managed to destroy the Tower of Conan, which sat on Tory Island. However, the Fomorians got reinforcements and almost completely eradicated the race of the Nemed. However, 30 people managed to escape on ships. For 200 years they had been away from Ireland. If you want to know more about that story you have to watch the video Who are the Fear Bulgs? But that brings us up to the year 3266 as the Fear Bulgs, the descendants of Nemed, the enemies, the rivals, the those who had fought against the Fomorians hundreds of years before, returned to Ireland. And they had the Kingdom of Ireland for the most part until the Anno Mundi 3303, when the Tuatha de Danann arrived in Ireland. This brings us up to the first battle of Moitora, which if you want to hear that story, you need to watch the video on the arrival of the Tuatha de Danann. See, I told you how all these videos are going to complement each other, and together they'll provide a very intricate tapestry of the different groups of people and their actions and their dynamics from the mythological counts of Ireland. So we find a sort of an alliance between the Tua Hedadanan and the Fomorians after the first battle of Moitora, and it's an interesting one because it really sheds light on this subject, which is complicated enough already. It's vague and it's difficult to find good information on, but when you do start to dive deeper into it, what do you find? Well, politics. In the first battle of Moitora, the arm of Nuada, who was king and leader of the Tuatha Danann, was severed in the battle. And under the Brehan laws, under the oldest laws of the land, a king could not be king if he was blemished. So therefore, Nuada had to give up the position of king of the Tuatha Danann. And who should it go to? Well, for some reason or another, the wives said that it should go to their adopted son, Brez, or Yochi Brez, who was son of Elaha. Brez's father, Elaha, son of Dalbeth, was a king of the Fomorians, but his mother was Eru, 
daughter of Delba, and belonged to the Tuatha de Danann. So Bres was of a mixed race here. His father was from Mori and his mother Tuatha de Danann. But he had been adopted and raised and was part of the Tuatha de Danann tribe. At first sight, the proposal, which was accepted by the Tuatha, seems strange in view of what has been said of the Fomorians as monstrous enemies who challenge Partalon and as the oppressors who caused the remnant of Nemed's people to abandon the country. However, in, in later stories, the Fomorian are giants and in ecclesiastical texts they are classed with elves and other misshapen creatures, the accursed sons of Noah. Before coming to Ireland, the Tuatha de Danann had made an alliance with the Fomorian, it seems, because you have intermarriage between the Tuatha de Danann and the Fomorians at a very early stage in the story of when they arrived to Ireland. How was Bres a grown man? More from Alwyn and Brinley Rees in Celtic heritage and ancient tradition in Ireland and Wales, Speaking on the birth of Brez, it is said that the second battle of Moitor, that Iru, the daughter of Delba, a woman of the Tuatha de Danann, was looking out to sea one morning and she saw a silver ship which brought a fair-haired youth wearing a gold-adorned mantle, who greeted her with, Is this the time that our lying with thee will be easy? They lay down together and the youth then told her he was Elaha son of Delba, king of the Fomori. He gave her a ring, which she should give only to one whose finger it fitted, and he prophesied the birth of a beautiful boy who should be called Yochi Bres. The boy was duly born and grew twice as rapidly as other boys. End quote. And on one day, 3,304, the reign of Bres begins. The kingdom was bestowed upon Brez on condition that he would surrender the sovereignty if his misdeeds should give cause. Anyway, he proceeded to go ahead and strip the Tuatha de Danann of their nobility, of their jewels, of their tribute, their cattle and their food. They reduced, he reduced their status. He forced them to engage in manual labor. Every house in the country fell under tribute via breaths to the Fomorian kings. The Dagda, who is the god of Druidism, labored at building a fort for Bres. And every day he surrendered the best part of his food to a monstrous satirist who tyrannized him. Ogma the mighty champion of the Tuatha, likewise suffering from lack of food, had to supply the host every day with firewood from nearby islands, and the sea would sweep away two-thirds of his bundle because of his weakness. The story goes on to explain how under Bress's rulership, under his leadership as a king, the Tuatha de Danann suffer, their nobility diminished. This could be said to reach a crescendo in the story called the Satire of Carberry. In this story, the warrior Brez, who was ruling during Noada's incapacity, but he was not popular, and he certainly wasn't hospitable. When a famous bard named Carberry, the son of the poetess Ethan, came to visit the royal court, he was sent to a dark chamber without a fire, or a bed, or food. Just some measly small cakes of bread is all he was given. To understand how offensive this truly was, you need to appreciate the high regard for hospitality given in early Ireland. It was offensive what Bress was doing. And the next morning, fuming, the poet left the court. But just before he did, he pronounced a scathing satire on the king. And according to our mythologies, the first satire that had ever been pronounced in Ireland. And this had the effect. You see, there was always a belief that 
The words of a poet were more than just mere words, that they carried power and force and effect. And to be satired by a poet, by a bard, by a druid, could mean the ruin of your life. Aside from the physical blotches that might appear on your face, the ridicule that you would face in society, the laughter that people would have when they see you, that would be enough to destroy you. And Brez was called to resign. And he did so, as you can imagine, with no grace or dignity whatsoever. His father, Eleha, was a Fomorian sea king, also called a pirate, and he retired to his court. But his reception there was not really what he had expected. So he went instead to Balor of the Evil Eye, a Fomorian chief. And together, the two warriors collected a vast army and navy and formed a bridge of ships and boats all the way from the Hebrides to the northwest coast of Ireland. And upon landing their forces, they marched to a plain in the barony of Tyrrell, County Sligo, where they waited an attack or surrender of the two ahead of Danon army. But the magical skill, or more correctly, the superior abilities of this people proved them more than equal to the occasion. That's from an illustrated history of Ireland from the earliest period by M.F. Cusack. The story then continues into the birth of Lou and the coming of Lou and the arrival of him into the two ahead of Danon, but we're not going to speak about that here just for the sake of time. But it's enough to say that Lou was also born half to a Dadanan and half Fomorian. However, in reverse, if I remember correctly, his father was to a Dadanan and his mother uh, Fomorian. Um, but it's enough to know that he was prophesied to slay Balor, who is his grandfather, Balor of the Evil Eye. And so when he arrived in Tara, he proved himself to the Tua Hadadanan and they accepted him as the new leader in place, in place of Bress. But before Lu arrives on the scene in Anna Mundi 3310, Nuada had gone through a bit of a miraculous healing when his physician, the magical Dean Kecht, he created a silver arm uh, to replace Nuada's lost arm. And so he ruled as Nuada Argilov, which means Nuada of the Silver Arm. Today, in County Kildare, there is a place called Maynooth, which in Irish is called Maynuada, which means the plain of Nuada, the king of the Tuathadadanan. Returning to Rees again in Celtic heritage and ancient tradition in Ireland and Wales, the maimed Nuada had long since been provided with a silver arm or an argotlov by Dean Kecht. But later Dean Kecht's son Milk healed his arm of flesh and he was reinstated as king of Tuathadadanan. So this explains why Nuada is now again king of the Tuathadadanan when Lu, who had not been raised with the Tuathadadanan, now a young man arrives at the door of Tara asking to be admitted. So impressed were the two ahead of Danin with this Lu, law father Samuel Donach, the long-armed master of all arts, that they chose him to be their leader in the second battle of Moitora, which occurred in Anno Mundi 3330. And it's in this battle that Lu lives up to the prophecy and slays his grandfather, Balor the Giant of the Mighty Blows and the Evil Eye, with a well-placed shot of his sling. Does this sound familiar? The plane on which this battle was fought retains the name of Moitora, meaning the plane of the towers or the pillars, and sepulchral mon monuments may still be seen on the ancient field to this day. Sadly, Nuada was also slain in the battle by the Fomorians. 
So in Alan Mundi 3331, the reign of Lufada, the long-handed, begins, and he establishes the firm of Teltu in Teltown County Mead. In Anno Mundi 3471, the joint reign of the last three kings of the Tuatha de Danann, Macul, Machecht and Magrana begins. And finally, 29 years later, in Anno Mundi 3500, we have the arrival of the Milesians and then the battles of Schlieve, Mish and Talche are fought and the three kings of the Tuatha de Danann are killed. Now onto the Fomorians. What I found interesting in my research of them is this kind of like blurred distinction that we have between the Fomorians and the Tuatha de Danann, and especially the kind of characters of Bress and Lou almost being counterparts of each other, where both of them are half Fomorian and half Tuatha de Danann, but on opposite sides. So. For one of them, the father is of Tuatha de Danann and the mother is of Fomorians and the other, it's, it's the vice versa. It's the other way around. We also see these kind of supernatural qualities associated to both the Tuatha de Danann and the Fomorians, but not so much the fear bulks. Okay, they might have druids and so on, but the Tuatha de Danann are always spoken of as being like adept at magic and the magical arts and the supernaturals. What's also interesting is the Fomorians never appear to be as settlers in Ireland in the same ways as the other groups of people. They remain kind of in the background throughout, like a boogeyman, like this monster that's always lurking in the shadows. They seem to always be associated with the sea, and from a kind of Jungian perspective, this is the idea of the subconscious and the unknown. And in this sense, the Fomorians could represent the aspect of the self and of nature that is untamed. And therefore, we are subject to it and at the whim of, uh, as compared to, say, the what the Tuatha de Danann symbolize, which is more of a kind of an order, a, a society, a artistry, a devotion, worship, like in the spiritual, like having a kind of a higher culture. So perhaps what we're, we're looking at here is more of a symbolic representation of the dark, uh, monstrous part of our own psyche, the untamed part of our own psyche, the primor primordial part of our own minds. We can also draw some parallels here from these stories with the myths and accounts from around the world. Like the biblical account of David and Goliath just sounds exactly like um, Lou and Balor to down to the fact that Balor is a giant and Lou is just like a young man and he kills him with a slingshot. When... But but there's obviously obvious differences here is that Balor is a supernatural giant with it, with one eye that whatever it looks on it gets destroyed. I don't think Goliath had that. Um, however, the ending of the Irish one is like way cooler because he knocks the eye so hard that it fires out the back of his head, out the back of his skull, and because this eye is a magical eye that causes anything it looks on to be destroyed. Well, it starts to completely eradicate the Fomorian enemy when it falls out the back of his skull and starts looking at them. It's a very cool ending. So that's an obvious parallel there. But there's other parallels that we can draw here with, say, the Vedas or Scandinavian mythology or uh, Greek and Roman mythology. Particularly the idea of having like two groups of gods who are fighting against each other. You know, you have the titans in the Greek mythology. In in Hinduism, you have the idea of the devas and the asuras. And you have this constant theme of a kind of a battle that's raging on throughout time, throughout history, and throughout our mythology of these two groups of, of divine, semi-divine. I say semi-divine because they're also subject to very, like, human qualities as well. Um... And it's, it's, it's replete in all of our mythologies throughout the world. 
if I had more time and maybe this is for another video, I'd love to explore this topic in more detail with you and explain how from a archetypal sense, from a, you know, psychoanalytical sense, looking at the, the themes that come out of these myths, um, and how they apply to our psychology and how they represent different parts of our mind and our psychology would be a really interesting uh, deep dive. And if anybody is interested in doing a bit more deep dive on that, check out my videos here on YouTube called The Psychology of the Gaelic Gods and Goddesses. Um, the book Beyond the Mist by Peter O'Connor also. And anything by the writer Joseph Campbell, um, who was... a uh, a comparative mythologist so he looked at the mythologies of the whole world and he he drew analysis from that that suggests that all of the mythology of the world is really about psychology and that's why it's still relevant today so i hope this has shed some light on the dark mysterious shady group of sea monster pirates called the fermorians i'm not too sure if it has <laughs> That's the thing with the Fomorians. That's the thing with this sort of research. It tends to leave more things unanswered, more questions unanswered than actually solved. But I do hope that I've given you a little bit more context with which to kind of think about and contemplate these these ideas. Who are the Fomorians? Who are the Tua Hadadan? And what did they mean? Do they represent something about ourselves? That's all for me for this time. Thanks for sticking around. I'll just remember this time to invite you to check out the website brehanacademy.org. Check out my online courses over there. I have a course on early Irish culture and society, one on mythology, one on the Brehan law, and I now have a free course on Gaelic Ireland, so be sure to check that out. And that's all for now. So, Gauramila Mahagut August Slong Fall.